Thank you so much. Is this on? It sound, feels like I'm in a living room. Mm, okay, I guess it is. Um, wow, have you guys ever felt like completely out of your league before? Um, I, I feel a little bit that way today, but it's actually good because I'm turning out to serve as my own best example for what I'd like to talk to you about. Jacques, take it away. Yay! Um, amateurism. Amateurism, I guess it's a, it's a concept. I'm sure I didn't come up with it originally, but I've, uh, I've been trying to, I, I put the ism on the end of it to kind of make it sexier. And uh, it's obviously working. But basically, I'm, 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 uh, I think of amateurism as the act of making the choice to put yourself in a situation in which you feel uncomfortable or you have no experience or very little experience. Basically, taking the risk to look incompetent, to end up the low man on the totem pole. Um, the important word, I think, in that concept is it's a choice. It has to be a choice, because plenty of us have been caught with our pants down from time to time, which is uh, always an interesting position to be in. But usually, it's a scary thing. Usually, we, we start to defend ourselves, or we look for a quick way out of that situation. So I think sometimes we miss the value that can be found in actually having to work from a place of, of weakness, having to trust our intuition, having to, uh, I don't know, learn on the fly, think by the seat of our pants. It can be cool. So um, like I said, I'm, I'm not really much of a public speaker. I'm going to keep this very simple because I have to. And uh, <laughs> um, I'm just going to tell you some stories, basically, which is something I need to practice anyway, as I'm about to marry into a Jewish family in May. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with a story about my friend Nick. This, as you can probably guess, is not actually Nick, but it's the best I could do uh, for free <laughs> shit on the internet. So, um, but Nick, uh, Nick is a surfer. I met Nick when I was 15 years old. We went to a church youth group retreat together, and uh, I, I was very drawn to him. He had like this incredible single-minded focus. I was like a really scattered kid, you know, and so he came off as really strong to me. So. Uh, we parted ways after that, but we stayed in touch over the years. We wrote letters, if you remember letters. Um, phone calls occasionally, but neither one of us had much money, so we didn't really talk that much. But um, I guess, uh, let's see, years passed by. As we got into our early 20s, I was here in Nashville uh, trying to make some sort of semblance of a career in the music industry. And uh, Nick had moved out to Laguna Beach, California to surf. And that was pretty much all he did. He surfed, he worked in a restaurant, he uh, smoked weed with a bunch of guys in a house on a beach, and that was kind of his life. Um, so I would send Nick progress reports about my uh, uh, music. You know, I'd send him demo tapes of my band. So finally I sent him one and he was really into it. He was so enthusiastic. He was like, dude, all I listen to is you, Marley, Dick Dale. And I go out and I catch a wave. It's so rad. <laughs> I was like, wow, Nick, that's amazing. Thank you. you know, I felt really chuffed or whatever. And um, uh, that went on for a while. And I was like Nick's favorite guy. And then he called me one time, and he was really agitated, which is strange because he was such a mellow, zen kind of guy. You know, he, he used the word mellow all the time and words like epic and gnarly. Um, <laughs> but he calls me. He's all worked up. And he's like, dude, I have bad news. And I'm like, really? He goes. Yeah, look, I was at a party last night, and I heard this music, and there's a band out there, and I think they're going to get huge. Everybody likes them. They're totally ripping you off. I was like, really? I didn't know, I didn't know what to think. I go, well, what are they called? He's like, oops, I missed them. <laughs> the Beatles. <laughs> the Beatles are totally ripping you off. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, you know, what do you do at that point if you're, if you're a Nashvillian? Kind of like, okay, I, Nick, are you serious? You really haven't ever heard of the Beatles? No, dude, I mean, I heard of them last night, but they sound so much like you. So, <laughs> so uh, I had to explain to Nick, you know, no, that's not the way it works. Actually, the Beatles are icons of pop music, and I'm probably shamelessly ripping them off. Um, but anyway, whatever, it, it, it got Nick totally into the Beatles, and it started this whole dialogue between us. 
Um, and I, you should know, was actually, and sort of still am, a Beatles, what I would consider to be a Beatles expert. I mean, at the time, I was just obsessed with the Beatles. I'd read everything you could get your hands on about the Beatles. I, I knew the name of Yoko Ono's grandmother. Um, like, I knew everything. And Nick had somehow, like at the age of 23, never heard any of the Beatles' music. So he just went nuts for it. He wanted to know everything he could. So we started this dialogue over, I don't know, a two or three month period where I was explaining the Beatles to Nick. And Nick was just like a kid in a candy store, just seeing all this stuff, hearing all this stuff for the first time. And I look back at that and I think, well, okay, in that situation, I was the expert. I had the level of proficiency. I had everything you needed to know about the Beatles. Nick knew nothing. Nick could have been embarrassed. Nick could have been like, you know, out of his depth. He could have played like the I'm too cool card and gone on and listened to more Marley. But no, he got to experience what I call like the first tenet of amateurism, why it's important, the joy of discovery. The joy of discovery which I realize sounds completely like a Hallmark card, but we, we underestimate the joy of discovery. We've taken it for granted that we learn something new every day, which may be true, but it seems like it's more and more difficult to actually remember what that thing is at the end of the day. Um, you know, the theme of, of TEDx, uh, Sense of Wonder, is, is awesome. Uh, in some ways, it's a little sad that somebody has to make it the theme of an event for us to remember what it is. But we forget about a sense of wonder because it's something that I think as adults we have to recreate a little bit, we have to nurture it, and we have to maintain it. It doesn't come as naturally as it did when we were a kid. But through things like the joy of discovery of a new, uh, a new band, uh, uh, a new restaurant, whatever you want to call it, whatever you're taking a risk on, whatever you're taking a chance by putting yourself out there to experience, uh, you, I think you renew the uh, sense of wonder. Let's move on. Uh, I want to tell you, during this thing, okay. <laughs> Thank you, I practiced that. Um, Curtis, I don't know Curtis, I just heard this story actually, so that's probably not Curtis either, but isn't he cute? <laughs> um, present tense, Curtis and his family are on an interstate highway. They're driving to a crappy timeshare in Panama City where they're gonna spend Curtis's spring break. And they get stuck in traffic. The, the whole interstate's been merged down to one lane. There's obviously an accident or something ahead, but basically they're stuck. Curtis is getting very bored. Uh, slowly but surely, their car rolls up next to the accident, which turns out to be a tractor trailer that, let's say this is happening in 1963 and um, tractor trailer height restrictions aren't quite as dialed in as they are today. So this truck has rolled up under a overpass bridge and is stuck. It's like crushed in it. So you have all the usual suspects that you would imagine to be at a disaster scene, uh, firemen, policemen, ambulance. They've got the jaws of life out there. They've, got, they've basically brought to bear every um, force of expertise that they can to you know, help out with this crisis situation, which is cool. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what they're trained to do. So Curtis and his family roll up, and Curtis is just you know, kind of doing that, looking out the window, and he calls up to his dad, and he's like, hey, dad, why don't they just let the air out of the tires? And his dad thinks for a second, and he rolls down the window, and he's like, hey, buddy, why don't you just let the air out of the tires? Sure enough, Everybody, the welders, the firemen go. The whole truck sinks like a foot, because those tires are big, and they can roll it out. So <laughs> Curtis is the hero. <laughs> Way to go, Curtis. And he takes it all so coolly. He's so chilled. Um, <laughs> so what can we take from that? Uh, amateurism, I think, or the, the state of being an amateur, allows us to look at things from a different perspective than an expert can. Now, I'm not knocking being an expert. I mean, definitely, like in this country, we're, we're encouraged to achieve brilliance, and it gets us big paychecks, and it gets us status in society, and I get it. I'm not saying everybody give up what you know how to do. But there's a lot to be said for not understanding a subject, viewing it, and just seeing what you're into, where your intuition leads you about it, or maybe you could call it common sense. We, we don't like to use those 
powers that we possess as often as we probably should because they're a little mysterious. We have to train them. Amateurism, I would say, is a way to keep doing it. Thank you, Curtis. You were very useful. Um, oh, right. Now we come to this asshole. Um, that's me, and my next little story is, is uh, going to be about me, and I'll, I hope you'll indulge me. I didn't want to talk about myself, but I just, uh, that's such a good picture. I think the, the, pho <laughs> <laughs> the, the photographer has gone for like a agoraphobic dandy kind of look. Yeah. <laughs> Came out great. Um, thank you. <laughs> When, uh, when I was 13 years old, I, I decided that I wanted to be a, a, a rock star, basically. And uh, I went through the requisite things that you try to do to achieve that. I learned how to play an instrument. I learned how to write songs. started singing a little bit. When I got out of high school, I went straight into the food service industry, which is like the farm leagues of, of rock and roll. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, uh, against all odds, somehow, like uh, roughly six years later, I actually got a, a record deal on a major label, if anyone remembers major labels. Um, <laughs> it seemed like a big deal to me at a time. And it was a big deal to me at a time. It was really like the realization of something I'd been going after for a long time. I don't mean to knock it. Um, so I put this record out. This is my first record. It came out in 1999. And uh, I started this, this cycle, which was really glorious to me. It was like... Um, I got to make a record, I got to go tour all over the place, and uh, then I'd write more songs, and then I'd make another record, and I got to go tour even more places, and then I'd write more songs, and then I'd, get, you know, and it was awesome, and I got to do a lot of things like, you know, shoot some videos, and I don't know, play on TV, I, I, think, I think maybe I got drunk with a couple of famous people that I don't remember very well. Um, but I hit a point in, in that career, which I think a lot of us probably hit in our, uh, chosen field of expertise where things just started to get dull. And it wasn't that the work was dull. It wasn't that I didn't love music. It was just that I did it all the time. And I'd gotten pretty good at it. I'd gotten to the point where nothing shocked me anymore. So I didn't really know what to do. It's like, well, this is kind of what I'd invested myself in. Here's a picture of me kind of at that point in my career where things are burning out. Yeah. Um, Things are going downhill. The beard comes into play and whatnot. So I got, I, got, I got an opportunity. How am I doing? Oh, you're kidding me. Did I start at 11? OK, thanks. That's perfect. I'm going to be really fast. Um, I got an opportunity to write a kid's song, which was uh, for a literacy center. And I'd never really written a kid's song before, but I thought I'd give it a go. It was a, they wanted a new alphabet song. Uh, which was cool, because I like the alphabet. It's very useful. <laughs> and so I went in, wrote the song, recorded it with my buddy David Henry, and we loved doing it. We gave it to them, and then we ended up doing eight or nine more, and suddenly we realized we had an album of this kid's music that was so fun. It was like totally liberating. It was the total opposite of that. And I was like, wow, wow, I love this. So we played the, we played the record for a few parents, and uh, they got positive response from their kids. And inevitably, we got asked to play a gig. So uh, we did. We became, we became Davey Ukulele and the Gag Time Gang. <laughs> right? I mean, just based on the warp job alone, it kicks the poop out of the other thing. Um, so we, we go play our gig, and now everybody in this band had been playing music for a long time. Like, we'd played thousands of gigs between us, and we thought, well, you know, this will basically be like any other gig we've done. We'll just, it's really up music, it's fun, it's just the audience will be shorter. <laughs> how, how hard could it be? Um, we were so wrong. I can already see some parents, like, maybe shaking their heads at how wrong we were. Um, <laughs> you know, kids are amazing. Like, they're the ultimate amateurs because they have absolutely no filters. They don't know how to behave in public. They don't know how to sit at the table and nurse an apple teeny and smoke a cigarette and, polite <laughs> and applaud politely when you get done with your pretty little song. They don't care. It's basically like if they like what you do, they're jumping around, they're dancing, they're all over the place. And if they don't like it, they just stand there and look at you like you punched them in the stomach. It's, it's awful. <laughs> so, so we learned really quickly in this gig, like, we had no idea what we were doing. Like, suddenly, all of our collective experience as seasoned musicians meant nothing in this gig that we were playing to, like, 40 kids. And it freaked us out. They kicked our butts. 
We were, we were soaked in sweat by the end of the first gig. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> you know, the median age of our band is probably 40 years old, and we're like, wah! But, um, but that's where something interesting happened. And again, this is what I'm going to go back to amateurism and say, that it's worth trying these things you don't know how to do and that you feel uncomfortable with. Because the whole band, for some reason, there was no money involved, no like artistic credibility, but we were like, we have to do this. And we came together and we started rehearsing this show. We rehearsed it so hard. We put together a whole program that was like skits and dances and we got my dog Stan involved in it. <laughs> and you know, we, we tightened up the wardrobe a little bit. We, we did that photo session. We were like, we're gonna do this. And you know what? The next gig was absolutely 100% better than the first one. And they've continued to get better, and we still do it. And honestly, against all of my expectations, that is the most gratifying musical thing I do to this point, because it gives me that feeling of being a beginner again. I never know what's gonna happen with kids. They're completely unpredictable. You think it's easy. You think you just go like this and whatever, but no, no, they're far more discerning than that. So. Um, I hope all this makes sense. I've really enjoyed talking to you <laughs> about it, but that's pretty much the thing. I just, I would challenge you guys uh, to, in whatever you're doing today when you're listening to the speaks, we have so many experts here, they're all great. Um, but challenge yourself. Challenge yourself to go a little deeper with things and just see if you can kind of get out of your comfort zone and then come back to where you're comfortable and see how it's affected. Uh, I'm gonna close today by giving you all and the opportunity to get seriously amateur with me. I thought Roger Cook's presentation was so awesome, except I didn't know if I was supposed to sing along or not, like the commercial. Did, did you guys want to? Yeah. You did, right? He's such a modest guy. He's so talented and so successful that he wouldn't pull the trigger. So anyway, I'm going to uh, pick up some of his loose slack and get you to do this. Um, is this on? Oh, I see what's going to happen. I'm so not used to wireless microphone technology. I feel like Ricky Martin, like, you know. <laughs> Can you hear this? Let me lift this up just a touch. OK. So I'm just going to play you a quick little song from the Davy Ukulele catalog. It's, uh, it's one of the deeper moments in the repertoire. And uh, then I'll, I'll teach you a little part, and we can all sing it together. OK. I think you'll concur, I hope you'll agree That it's okay to sing about the poop and pee Birds in the air and fish in the sea I'll do it just as natural as nature can be Everybody Just as natural as nature can be People in France and old Italy Your ma and pa and uncle Lou and cousin Manny Everybody Okay, this is going to be you guys. Could you get that part that everybody poops? <laughs> I'm going to try to... This is going to get totally complicated. I'm going to try to split this down the middle. Can you guys sing that? This everybody At the same time, you guys sing, singing about the poop and pee, singing about, come on, we don't have much time, let's get it together. Singing about the poop and pee, singing about the poop and pee, singing about the poop and pee. All right, I got no, I got zero minutes, I just found out, so let's make this count. One last chorus. One, two, everybody poops. That is so beautiful. That's what we in the field and fish in the sea I'll do it just as natural as nature can be I think you'll concur I hope you'll agree that it's okay to sing about the poop and pee Thank you so much Go amateur, I know you can